welcome we're going to join us this evening um kia ora hinemoa kia ora holia and thank you carolyn so we've got Moirangi joining us this evening. I want to start with you letting us know who you are and where you're from. Well, tēnā koe e hoa, uh, tēnā tātou te whānau. Uh, me ki e kai o mata uh, ki pātanga ta maunga. Uh, he moko pina tēnei no te whānau a tui whakairi ora. Um, so, yeah, my heart and soul is whare kahika. Um, it was colonised as Hicks Bay, but uh, we're reclaiming whare kahika. Um, and I also have connections um, in Taranaki, Te Whānau Apanui, um, and also Te Moana Nui Akiwa. So yeah, koe rā koeau, uh, ko moirangi tōku ingoa. And where do you currently live, Eho? Um, yeah, great question! <laughs> um, so Who I'm are you currently under Rahui? <laughs> I've just moved, like, I recently just graduated um, from Waikato, came down to Wellington for an internship, um, decided that I loved Wellington, stayed in Wellington, um, and then now I'm with my whānau um, in Purirua uh, during this Rahui period. So I'm in Purirua. Oh, choice. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, now... I met you, what, seven, eight months ago for the first time. Um, funny story. So, met you, awesome wahine, met you through a totally different kaupapa, a periku mātau, um, had you come and stay in my whare, continue to call it. got flooded. Yeah, when you got flooded out, continue to call it all afterwards. One day, boy was on TV, I'm sitting at home, I look at my TV screen and I go, um, Dynasty looks like <laughs> Oh gosh. So, uh, you were Dynasty on Boy, the movie, child, child actress. <laughs> <laughs> Was that something that you had ambitions doing or did you just get caught up in, in that whole mahi and someone dragged you along to be a part of it? Well, oh, oh you're funny. You're funny. I knew you were going to bring something up. Anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, me mihi ki te rā Boy is actually, um, was released 10 years ago um, to this year. So 2010 it was released. Um, and yeah, so everybody knows Taika Waititi um, is from Whanaapanu, he's from the East Coast, and um, <clears throat> yeah, so he did a lot of his casting around the East Coast, um, and he came to our kura, um, which was awesome. Um, I originally didn't want to do it, my dad said, just do it, it'll be a, um, a good opportunity, uh, and it was, it was, it was really, really fun. Um, but yeah, so it's not necessarily something I had ambitions on doing. Um, and just a little bit on, on that, um, in terms of his casting and, and characters, a lot of people say, actually this sounds fucking he is, but people say, oh, you were a great actress or you were all great actors or child actors. And I, I, I always say one of the things that made Boy a really, really successful film was that 95% of the cast and their characters actually really were really, really similar. Um, so it was that whole raw um, kind of playing out of your character. So Dynasty's little frown she's got going on and her little sis was definitely me <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> and some would say still me today. Um, but so yeah, to answer your question, it, it wasn't necessarily something. Um, that I was looking into um, as a young kid and now as, a, as an adult. Do you have people recognise you? Well, because I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Until I saw you on the movies all that time later. So do you ever have people recognise you or come up to you? Yeah, yeah. I mean, every now and then. It was, it was much more frequent um, when I was younger, um, which was quite, quite obvious. Um, but yeah, every now and then, and Women's Weekly or Women's Day did a 10-year um, reunion release on us, and now, because I have a moko, um, I had people, like, following me or messaging me and being like, hey, you're the girl. Um, 
which is something that the, the rest of the um, uh, my peers and, and the cast um, have also. So yeah, to answer your part, so, yeah, sometimes, but but not all the time, which is kind of how I like it sometimes. So 10 years on, you are wahine mau moko. Um, you are rangatahi mau moko. And I wanted to talk to you a bit about that because it's something that, um, well, I've been looking at quite a bit for the last year um, and trying to get my own head around what my decision might be around Moko Kauai. When did you decide, if you even decided yourself at all, to receive your Moko Kauai and what, what was that process for you? Um, <clears throat> let's just say when I, when I was 12 um, in Kuda, um, my, cu- my older cousin Rihi um, and I would always uh, talk about getting moko. Um, and I, I was very fortunate to grow up um, in a community, in a whānau, in a hapu, where moko is already quite accepted. So it wasn't an unfamiliar conversation um, as young kids, as rangatahi um, and, and as a whānau. Um, so yeah, when I was 12, we used to talk about it all the time. And my uncle, Jack Brooking, and my dad actually used to joke, oh, yeah, we'll just chuck you on the table and chisel you up, because they're both covers. Um, that I would, and then that kind of freaked me out, and it put me off for a solid five years. <laughs> um, and then Moko Papa, so Moko Papa has been happening for 30 years um, along the East Coast. I think, forgive me if I get the years wrong, I think we may be in our maybe seventh now of Tafana Kauai Tango here. Um, he hononga no uh, oku ki reira um, Marainui had their tenure a few few years back But anyway, on the east coast um, Moko Papa is something that's um, been happening For a very, very long time uh, We had our first Moko Papa at Mai Marae Hinemauria Would have been just under three years ago um, And then we had our second one uh, last year And when that conversation came around About our having our second Moko Papa um, I was starting to think again like oh yeah um, this is my time I hadn't necessarily been like yep I'm in um, and then my older cousin Rihi, who, who I spoke about before when I was young um, messaged me and she said oh kia ora moi moi. Um, this is what's happening back home uh, because I have obviously I'd moved away and lived in Waikato um, and she said ko koe hei whare ki moku um, which ko koe hei whare ki moku um, when, when, it first, when that first Kōraro came around, I think it was my Auntie Kitty, we used to think Fariki was somebody who would like, you know, hold their hair, massage their feet, make a cup of tea if they want a cup of tea. Um, but Fariki is a concept of moko papa, um, that you receive your moko alongside your moko papa, you know, papa, ground, moko, mm-hmm. Fariki, getting moko lying on the ground. Sorry, I just... <laughs> Quite a <laughs> anyway, um, she said, ko koe hei whariki moku. Um, and it was lit- literally um, when she asked, it was at that moment. I try to explain this feeling to people um, when, when they say to me, oh, I've been thinking about getting moko. And, and this isn't something moko wide, it's just something that I felt. It's like <laughs> you just know it's the feeling, you just know that you're ready. Um, you, sometimes you may think you're ready, you've been thinking about it. Which is, which is like awesome, it's the first step towards being like, yep, you're ready. But it's just like a day um, or a time where you're just like, I'm ready. And it, I don't know, it's, I don't know, when you're ready, you're ready. So yeah, it was definitely something I'd always um, thought about. Um, and like I said, fortunate, very, very fortunate um, to grow up around whānau, a hapu um, and community um, where moko was very, very familiar. So yeah, always knew. There's obviously, and there has been for a while, a huge resurgence in Moko Kauai, Moko Kanohi Mataura. Um, and just yesterday or the day before, I posted on our Nuku page about what is an Indigenous woman and that there are all these stereotypes about what an Indigenous woman is. You have to be a certain percentage of blood, quantum. You have to have brown skin. You have to korero, yoreo, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I basically said fuck all of that because <laughs> <laughs> that's bullshit. <laughs> Whakapapa is what makes you an indigenous wahine. And I know that there's been a lot more korero recently around um, what, what it means to wear mokokawai and what you have to do to earn 
moko kawai because I know that there has been this whakaro for so many years that you have to earn your moko um, or you have to be of a certain age or you have to know your reo um, and all of these sorts of things. Did you ever um, think about that for yourself? Did you have your own um, benchmark that you wanted to reach or didn't, didn't come into play at all? Um, no. Like you said, fuck all of that. Um, <laughs> and no, no, to answer, to short answer your question, no, um, I didn't, I haven't ever had that, I never had that whakaro and I haven't ever had that whakaro. Um, and it just goes back um, to being fortunate uh, to grow up in and around um, moko. Like my, my father is head to toe moko. Um, my auntie who um, done my moko, she's moko. Um, and she was also taught um, in the school of moko by Papa Derek, um, Papa Mark. Um, so those kind of stalwarts in the in the moko world um, in terms of revitalizing um, moko kanohi. Uh, so the conversations, those types of um, stereotypes aren't necessarily things that I had heard um, as, as a kid or as a, as a teenager. It wasn't until I came out out of, of the East Coast that I um, had started to hear those kind of negative connotations around moko. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but to, in saying that, it's not something that had ever um, put me off because I knew in myself um, that first and foremost, I, I knew that um, koto whakapapa koto toto Māori noiho to passport ki te ao te moko. Um, so being Māori is your own, the only thing that you need um, to, to receive your moko. Um, and secondly, I think this was the biggest thing for me, is I knew that I had the backing um, of my whānau, of my hapu, of my iwi, um, and of the wider moko papa, kaupapa, um, and, the, and its resurgence throughout um, Aotearoa. So, yeah, no, it wasn't something um, I had yeah, ever thought about or let affect me, um, but it is something um, that we hear a lot um, mm. and we are still hearing um, as, as young people. And there's a, there's a, lot, there's a fine line and, um, again, another corridor that I saw actually earlier this year where that fine line was being discussed was you don't have to qualify to wear moko kawai, but also moko kawai is not a fashion accessory. And that while anybody who has whakapapa Māori is entitled to receive a moko kawai, you don't just go and get it just because. And so there, there's, um, that was another kōrero I saw come out earlier this year because uh, moko kawai has resurged so much in, I suppose, popular culture and what we're seeing um, wahine everywhere, which is beautiful, um, wearing kawai. There are some spaces where now it's becoming the in fashion or the in thing. Have you ever come across that yourself? Um, Without well, throwing anyone under the bus? <laughs> because I don't necessarily want to... Um, yeah, I don't necessarily want to put my own um, whakaro onto anybody else's moko juni. I mean, your mm -hmm. moko juni is your moko juni, whether you get it um, because you think it's the next Chanel, whether you get it because you're Māori. Um, I think, for me personally, it, it goes back to, first and foremost, yourself. Um, secondly, your tohunga. Um, and... Like, I think that conversation is really, really important. So my auntie Johnny, like I said, um, the one who did my, my moko, she has known that I've wanted moko since I was a, a kid. So it's been a conversation that we've had for the last um, 10 years. I mean, I'm 23 now. Um, and I was 23 when I, when I received my moko. Um, so that's a conversation that needs to happen between you and your tohunga and my I see, I don't even want to say opinion because who am I to have an opinion um, on your moko? Um, but yeah, personally, I think that's something you need to talk about, your why. Um, also, um, like I can only speak from the experience of a moko papa um, in your whariki um, because I know there are other tohunga, other iwi, other rohe that um, 
give moko in a different capacity, so not necessarily through moko papa, um, where you just this isn't to fuck to anyone who has done this, but you know potentially going to the to the moko shop and getting your moko done there by yourself, so not necessarily with a fariki, um, or you know other ways where the moko artist comes to your fare and your fano and you're still receiving it um, by yourself. And like I said, I can only um, speak from um, my own experience with Fariki and Moko Papa, I think um, it's that accountability. That's for me is the importance of having a, a Moko Papa, but having a Fariki because I received my Moko alongside I think eleven other wahine um, from my from my marae, um, and we're still accountable to each other. You are not only accountable to your Fariki. You're accountable to the previous moko papa. You're accountable to your tohunga and all the many moko papa that um, your tohunga um, has performed moko. So when I talk about accountability, I just want to I, I want to touch on that because I mean, just say your cousin Tom. Tom, how do you make Tommy? That's a girl's name. Just gonna say Tommy got her moko and she was in your fariki, and you think, guys, that's my homemade life going gum. Um, it's my phone. Um, just say Tommy got her moko, and you're thinking, oh, Tommy's been a bit of a dick. That's a, that's the responsibility of your fariki, your moko papa, to say, hey, Tommy, don't be a dick, because when you be a dick, you're making us all look like dicks. Um, and that's a quote from my auntie Kitty um, when that whole conversation came around Pakeha receiving moko. So it's a whole other story. Mm -hmm. um, but I think with moko, not, not just mataora or kauai, I think any moko, um, your, your spirals on your skin, if you're going to play up and wear it as a fashion accessory, makes us all, and I'm not just talking about your whariki and your moko papa now, I mean tau Māori whanui. So accountability is a big thing um, for me. And, and, and I, like I said, keep saying, in terms of our whariki um, and our moko papa. So, yeah. Mm. I think I went off Kaupapa me, but always yeah. on Kaupapa. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I hope, I hope my little, little rant made sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, this afternoon I had a tattoo with this new app that I found on Instagram, which um, has a moko kawai. And because um, I didn't do kapahaka when I was at college I was in the new Anne group so, so I didn't really get to have a tutu with with like a stamp moko or drawn moko and last year when we were in the height of what was happening at Ihumato there was a moko papa in a sense on the whenua uh, where many of our whanau received their moko kawai and two of our tane received their matora and seeing my cousins receive their moko kawai was hugely emotional um but it has and, and my aunties actually and it has been beautiful walking around the pa and seeing these faces that weren't there before and it becoming a familiar sight in our papa kainga and in our marae because my grandmother and her cousins never had moko kawai um and so to see those layers of generations afterwards um, wearing them, which has been beautiful. Even though I know the kōrero um, and the whakaro around moko kawai is that there is no benchmark that you, that you must reach in order to receive it, um, my personal benchmark is my reo. And my reo, I've, I've literally got my puka puka here. <laughs> and my other, here. I've gone old school even. Because um, I find it, I learn kupu easier when I actually read it in the dictionary instead of just um, punching it in the Māori dictionary.com. And even though my reo is enough, I suppose, to talk to my pepe, it's not enough to make me feel confident to kōrero Māori, you know, i te katoa. And so, um, yeah, that's my, that seems to be where I've put my personal benchmark in terms of receiving my moko kawai. Now, I know that another whakaro of yours is that te reo Māori is a form of decolonisation. And you speak te reo Māori all over social media. Um, 
And I'm really interested to know how you see that as a, obviously there are some obvious reasons why you see it as a form of decolonization. But how is it a powerful form of decolonization from your perspective? Um, <clears throat> wow, well, you're just going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> Back to university. <laughs> um, yeah, so I, I just want to answer this in, in two parts. Um, firstly, to talk about your personal bench, your personal benchmark um, with in terms of moko and te reo Māori. I think that's amazing. Um, I think it's really awesome to set a personal benchmark. Um, this is just my own personal whakaro, not the whakaro of my tohunga, of my mokopapa, um, of our whariki. Um, but I think te reo Māori should be the benchmark in terms of moko, and I'm not saying don't receive your moko if you don't have, um, if you don't speak te reo Māori. Um, what I'm saying is let it, let it um, set your soul on fire to be in the pursuit of te reo Māori, because Ko te reo Māori, um, te tuakiri o, o tō tātou ahurea. Um, like I think people, um, you know, they receive tāmoko um, to, to feel a part of, to feel Māori. Um, but let me tell you, speaking te reo Māori, there's nothing, there's nothing like it um, in terms of feeling, um, feeling Māori. So setting a personal um, benchmark, I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm all here, I'm here for setting personal benchmarks and secondly in terms of moko and and lastly I just want to say I'm here for you um in any way that I can be around that journey um it's something that I really really want to encourage um Māori um to pursue uh, te reo Māori so yeah um, waiho mātou moko koe e kawe uh, ki te ao o te reo Māori um and then secondly in terms of your um pātai around how do I see it as a form um of decolonisation um, like you said, there are some obvious ones. Um, we had our deal stripped from us. Um, it was, you know, beaten out of um, our tupuna. I know every, pretty much every single Māori has that same story, the generation of our grandparents that had te reo Māori um, beaten out of them as a form um, of colonisation. Um, and then there's all the effects um, that that has had, not only on our culture, but also on whānau, on hapu, on iwi, um, and Aotearoa whānui. So um, I see te reo Māori as a form of decolonisation, firstly because, <laughs> and I know this is really um, the unorthodox answer, I suppose, but it makes people really, really uncomfortable. Like, I speak te reo Māori on the bus. Actually, it's not. I'm not doing it to be obnoxious either. It's just... Like, a, te reo Māori is something, like, I think in te reo Māori, so when you're talking to me, my head, like, translates it, so I'm, like, working double time um, in my head to understand or try and translate what you're saying to me. So, yeah, like I was saying, I'm not being obnoxious when I speak te reo Māori, but it makes people really, really uncomfortable, um, first and foremost. And then, secondly, you might get the odd smile or the odd kia ora, um, and that's, some, that, that's the reason why... Like that, <laughs> it's like I'm, I'm, I'm saying that I'm happy that people struggled to hear te reo Māori. But I just want to give you an example. Um, so my disruption create positive. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all about uh, disrupting <laughs> in a Māori way. Um, yeah. But I just want to give you an example. So um, my flatmates, uh, when I moved down to Wellington, we would catch the bus every day um, into Mahi, into central Wellington. I would catch the same 7.30 bus every morning and... Um, yeah, every morning, obviously, we'd all speak um, te reo Māori. And then our bus driver, so first day it was, hello, girls, and next day it was, hello, girls. And then the second day it was, kia ora. And, you know, it took us by surprise, like, this old Pākehā fella, you know, saying kia ora. And then, you know, that's something that really warms the heart. And then the next day was what really, um, you know, that, that was something that made us really, really happy is when he said to us, Kia ora, and then he struggled a bit there, and he said, oh, how do I say good morning, ladies? Um, and then we said, oh, morena wahine ma, and then every day after that, he would ask for new phrases, um, and he would ask for different ways to say different things. Um, he didn't give us a free ride, though, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, it's just little things like that that kind of make me go, yeah, talking to the Māori in public is cool. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, that's just one one example. But in terms of 
um, decolonization, you know, there's, there's things like, like the treaty and all that stuff. And I think other people can speak, um, speak to the treaty. But yeah, Te Reo Māori for me is the epitome um, of land protection. Now, I say this in a, you know, I say this from my own personal why am I saying I say this from my own personal when I'm the, obviously one speaking? Anyway, I say this on my own for Carol. This has come from nobody. But I say ko te reo Māori, te reo o te whenua. And when I say that, I, I mean when you're speaking um, te reo Māori, uh, I think that you're speaking the language of the land. And, and this, I think, can cro across, this can go across all Indigenous languages because of that relationship that we have to whenua. Um, so that, for me, is what I mean about te reo Māori. Um, is a form of decolonization because we're speaking the language of the land that was taken from us firstly and secondly the language that was taken from us so yeah that was the answer I was trying to get to on my long little whakapapa I had going there. Um, I wanted to ask you because I've been following you on Instagram and I wanted to ask how you're coping with Rahui in particular how you're coping with not being able to go out and get kana? <laughs> um, oh my gosh! So for those for those of you who know me, like I I I grew up on the east coast, legit on on the Moana, um, and yeah, I, I <laughs> it's not <laughs> yes, I'm missing kana so much, um, but it's more that um, connection to Tangaroa that I'm mm. really really missing. Um, yeah, Tangaroa for me is not only a space of whakanoa, um, but uh, Tangaroa is definitely a space that I gain, um, regain in energy, um, maori, and just a place where I can kind of be me and release um, <clears throat> anything that's, go that's going on. Um, like for me, like, you know, it it's a really... Um, obvious cordial in terms of the moana but you know the sea doesn't um doesn't separate us it connects us so when i go to the moana whether i'm in wellington or not um i'm you know i'm at the moana and i'm thinking of my home i'm thinking of te tairawhiti i'm also thinking of um my islands in te moana nuiakiwa so it's that connection that i'm really really missing um and then just on a real level i just really want a fit creamy kind of on toast. See, I can um, you on the moana kōrero, because I, today I hit the wall. Today I, in that, I asked you earlier what phase we're in on the maramataka, and we happen to be in a tangaroa phase. <laughs> um, and I feel like today was a day that a lot of people were feeling bad. <laughs> no kapu <laughs> for the feeling but I feel like today was one of those days because everybody I spoke to today was feeling a bit blah and I seem to have been coping with Rahui fine until today and today I just like hit this wall I didn't want to do anything I had no inspiration to do any mahi I was a stink as mother um, <laughs> I was just like Trying to find something, I had to get out of the house and I haven't been out of my neighbourhood since we went into Rahu because my Tani still goes to Mahi so he does our grocery shopping. So today I went to the supermarket and I bought chocolate and chips and apple pie and ice cream <laughs> and cider <laughs> <laughs> and all these things that I haven't been eating for three weeks because I've been really good and trying to, you know, be good with my home water. Um, but I couldn't do that today. And so needed those things to get me through. And normally what gets me through is the moana and being able to go to Tangaroa and to Pure and to, yeah, like Whakanoa and all those, that connection that we have. I don't like kumas. Um, <laughs> like really, really. That's really right. Good. I love people who don't like kumas. You don't like kuna. Yeah, because it means more kuna for you. Um, <laughs> But I wanted to ask you about the tangaroa phase and um, oh, how do you whakanoa when you don't have access to the places and people you would usually seek solace in? Oh, I'm gonna, I will answer that question soon because um, I just wanted to ask about the tangaroa phase 
and whether those tangaroa phases impact how we're feeling and why we're all feeling a little bit meh at the moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm totally feeling you on that. Um, <laughs> I think um, the biggest thing, like I'm no maramataka expert at all. I don't think, um, yeah, I'm not a maramataka expert at all. Um, but one thing I have, I have been following um, the maramataka for about three years now. Um, and one big thing I've noticed with myself um, that in the tangaroa phases, um, because tangaroa is um, a big thing, eh, it's all about unpredictability. So when you think of tangaroa as an atua, he is very unpredictable. Um, unless you're like Papa Reriata and you can read him like, like that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he is a very unpredictable atua. So, um, you know, it it's, it's makes sense when you think around um, this phase in terms of unpredictability and that could look like anything from sunshine to rain um, to a happy mood into a stink mood you know it, it's all unpredictable um, but when I think about tangaroa um, for myself one thing I like to do during the tangaroa phase is go to tangaroa um, <clears throat> for very obvious reasons but um yeah and so when I like going back to the to the marama I try to Tangaroa, go to Tangaroa and, and kind of just, I write down those little things um, every day when I'm thinking about Tangaroa or, or like you said, those little mood changes, I write those down um, and some, there'll be, a, you know, there, there's some days or some months where I'm not even following, um, not not following the marama, but I'm not necessarily every single night or every single day being like, oh yeah, it's rakune, oh yeah, it's okoro. Mm. Um, but there are some days when, uh, when I'm just like, oh my gosh. And because I know how I'm feeling, I'm like, oh, yeah, it must be tangaroa. Um, but I think on top of that, I see these memes, and I think it's a Pakia meme. Um, but it's like, don't blame your feelings on the moon. And I kind of just, I'm just like, <laughs> how do you? What's going to do that, jokes? But it's kind of also um, a reality check in terms of, um, and this may be a tip for those of you who are or have or are looking into following um, the marama is, not not only follow the marama and know uh, when it you know kind of sways your mood, but kind of recognize that, acknowledge it, and you don't necessarily have to unpack it and you know pull it all apart and be just happy happy person um, every single time. But you're able to have some sort of control around how you're reacting and responding to things um, during that marama phase. And and I know we're in um, Tangaroa at the moment, but I just want to give you an example. In terms of Rākaunui, Rākaunui is a high energy moon. And for a lot of people, it's their favorite moon phase. Um, but for myself, it's probably the hardest moon phase for me because because it's so high energy, my mind is ticking over time and it puts me into a state of, holy shit, I'm so overwhelmed. And it's not necessarily a time where I want to exert all that energy. I kind of just want to hide and I, I'm just so overwhelmed and I don't know what to do with the energy. So I just hold myself back. And I've um, acknowledged that and I've recognized that. And, yeah, so like I said, it's a tip. You know, you may want to just, you know, know that when you're in Tangaroa, you're feeling like this. So what are some of the things that can help you? And for you, um, that's cider and chippies. So <laughs> get cider and chippies every Tangaroa. <laughs> yeah, it's funny you say that about the Rako Noi Moon. I was talking with my cousin the other week. Because Rako Noi, the idea of Rako Noi is that it's high energy and it's a good day to do mahi and you're, you should feel amped and you should have that energy. And actually, I've just, I have in my heart out been monitoring the marama, but I've sort of randomly been thinking about how I'm feeling in accordance with the marama. And I find that my highest energy and when I want to clean the house and do all of that kind of mahi is on a whiro moon. And when I feel really tired and exhausted is on a rako night. I'm exactly so the same. I'm my exactly cousin, the same. I, I nicknamed my cousin Pure Heart because he's got a very pure heart. And I said, so it must mean that I don't have a pure heart because <laughs> I find my, my happiest, most energetic time in the fiddle. <laughs> yeah. And I think, like, when we, when we think about fiddle, there's always poor fiddle. Fiddle's always getting the flack for everybody. Oh, you know, feeling like shit must be fiddle. You know, all these things. That, and mm. like I said, it's like that whole meme thing. Don't blame the moon for how you're feeling. But I'm exactly the same. Fiddle is not necessarily when I'm feeling my best, but I'm like, yeah, I'm pumped. Um, so just want to mihi to fiddle for all the, you know, all the flack that he, he gets. Um, but he, you know, fiddle is, is, is the best moon phase for me in terms 
um, of, of doing mahi. And I think it's that whole um, recognising and acknowledging what works for you. Um, mm -hmm. And that's another big thing around Maramataka. Um, you know, one of the most popular Maramataka books around at the moment is Living by the Moon. Um, na koro wiremu tāwhai, but a lot of people take that and quite take take it all literal. But when you think about the environments of the whānaupanui, you've got the bush, you've got the sea, um, and then this is to, you know, I'm not even going to say it all here, somebody from a certain dohe that has no bush, you know, and they have a lake and just, or no sea, mm. they may just have lake and bush, and they're still using the same um, kōrero and advice that's in Living by the Moon. So I think... Yeah, Maramataka is not only regional, it's also personal. Um, yeah, because you've got to look at the tohu around you, not so much the tohu around yeah. everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to go back to this, this partai before we forget it, before we forget to answer it, uh, which is how do you whakanoa when you don't have access to the places and people you would usually seek solace in? Is that for me or for you? Both of us. Well, I'm, okay. I'm happy to answer, but it's for both of us. Oh, do you want me to go first? <laughs> well, I'll go first because I might be like, oh, your answer's too cool, and then I might lie. No, just... <laughs> go. No pressure. Um, go. How do I fucking know? To be freaking honest, I for the first about like, I'm not even going to be dramatic, like, week, I'm, I'm going crazy in my head. I'm overthinking and being like, I can't get to Tangaroa, or I can't work out, or, you know, I start to overthink and then put myself in a silly little state um, and usually it, if it's not myself it's usually my friends that will snap me out of them and be like come on girl back to it um, but yeah how do how do I um, whakanoa and this isn't even a big um, like tikanga thing like it's not like I go under some tree and karakia um, but whakanoa um, for me looks like just sitting and closing my eyes and just letting all those whakaro that are going on um, in my head, the things that I need to whakanoa, just be. And I kind of feel mm. the feeling. And whether that takes one day to two weeks, and that, like it's, it's happened in the coming into lockdown, um, I just let it take two weeks. Um, it's not probably not healthy. Um, and it's also, I'm not advising you to do it, but something that I do... Um, and yeah, like I've, I've moved a lot in my life and I've moved from Waikato now to Wellington. So the whole changing in environments thing um, is hard for me. So I think what doesn't change when your environment changes is you um, because you're, you're the vessel that's moving into those um, different spaces. So yeah, for me, I just sit with myself um, and kind of release and feel those whakaro and those emotions, what's going on. Um, and then when I can, I go to water, any type of water. I mean, a shower's still water. Mm. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's not some. Um, that's not some wisdom the answer, but that's what I do. I think for my whanau, um, since we've been in Dahui, we've been, well, you know, limited as to what we can do, where we can go. And we're lucky that we live um, in a papa kainga that is close to the coast, even though we can't swim in our awa because it's paru. We can't swim in our moana because it's paru. But we can still go there. And so the other day, uh, my tanya, my pepe and I went for a hikoi. And I thought that the hikoi was going to be my whakanoa. But actually... On that hikoi, we decided that instead of taking the road walk, we were just going to walk down to the bush, which is not, it's not like a East Coast bush, but it's, <laughs> it's got a, you know, it's a little bush. And so we ended up going there and I started to pick the korari off the harakeke, the dried korari, and then we introduced my pepe to toy toy, and she'd never really seen toy toy before, and so we, and I didn't have a knife, so I was cutting heaps of this stuff with my teeth. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> um, but I realised that 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 whole harvesting of those resources was what was helping me to whakanoa. And then as we carried on with our hikoi, um, 
Tafiri Matia was in some kind of mood uh, and was just blowing yeah. hard up. And it's after, yeah, just like standing in the wind and almost letting it blow it all off you and out of you um, was really awesome. My baby got sick and now has a chesty cough. So I, so I probably would recommend that if you're going to Whakanoa in that way, don't take your baby with you. Um, but yeah, it, I just I didn't plan on that being the thing. Um, but it turned out to be that. And if you'd have seen us that day, we were walking home. I had like, I don't know, 12 korari that I'd lashed together with harakeke that I chewed off the bush. <laughs> Carrying it back, we went on this like, long as hikoi. And it's, um, if you were to drive here, it's, it looks like an urban space, but we just managed to find a bushy area. So that's how we did it. Um, Oh, there was something else I was going to ask you about the marama. Oh, for those of you, that was a thing. For those of you that are listening or that are watching that don't know what we're talking about in regards to maramataka, um, because not everybody is familiar with maramataka. Maramataka is our lunar calendar. And when we talk about rākau nui, rākau nui is the full moon. Fero is the new moon. There are moon phases in between, which will have their own ingoa. And um, some of the places you can find out more information about Maramataka is um, you can watch Wakahuya, which has a really awesome um, interview with Matuarere Atamakiha, who is a tohunga Maramataka. Um, I've had the privilege of working with him a number of times, and he is phenomenal. Um, there is... Heni Hotrene and Ruben Taipari up north, who I think it's maramataka.com is their website, and they make maramataka calendars. Um, and Heni also shares on the maramataka page regularly on their Facebook page, um, kōrero around different phases of the maramataka. You've got the wahine from Tuhi Stationery, who... Um, also kōrero about maramataka and they have maramataka diaries um, and resources and they run workshops and I'm pretty sure they'll have some webinars while we're in Rahui. And who else can I think of? And then of course there's that puka puka that you had mentioned, um, Living by the Māori Moon. So those are some of the resources that people can look out for um, in and around the kōrero of maramataka. Um... Being in lockdown when it rains, I take the opportunity to get out into the rain or in the wind and have my puri in whakanoa. If it doesn't rain, I take time to find space in the garden or outside. That's Kelly Henry Te Kare who shared that kōrero. Um, so the other thing I wanted to talk to you about tonight, because um, we had a bunch of topics that we were talking about earlier because you were nervous. But hello, check you out. Not even nervous anymore, girl. No, I am. I'm so ready and I'm like shaking. I have to hold the bed to not shake. <laughs> Don't be <laughs> nervous. Don't address my anxiety. Let's just keep going. <laughs> Don't be, there's only 54 people watching and listening to every word you're saying. Don't be nervous. No. <laughs> um, my part I, my next part I, which... Um, I'm going to use this time to ask those of you that are watching if you have any pātai for Moirangi or for myself or any of the kōrero that we're talking about, please um, ask and share in the comments. Um, but I'm going to lead us into the next kōrero, which is around tokenism and being the token Māori um, or being the token wahine or being the token rangatahi or being the token whatever token you are. Um, and I... I'm not saying that in the spaces that I've seen you, you have been the token, but I know that you are often called to totoko a lot of things and because you have the skills that you have um, and because you move in the spaces you do, you're often asked to participate in things or lead things or karanga for something or whatever. What's your whakaro and what are your experiences about being the the token brown Māori maumoko wahine. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, so, um, yeah, tokenism for me used to be a hard conversation to have, to be honest, and it wasn't until um, I kind of talked to a few friends and that I was able to articulate it um, and recognise that it was tokenism. 
um, because growing up um, on the East Coast, I, um, I, you know, I never saw tokenism, I think, you know, he Māori no. Um, so being Māori was normal, being rangatahi was normal. Mm. You were kind of, everybody was in their own, I don't want to say category, everybody was in their own role. So um, you weren't necessarily called on um, to be a token person in a different space. So um, it wasn't until, again, I left um, the East Coast that I saw how much it happened and then I started to feel and recognize that it was happening um, to me. And like I said, it was something, it's something hard to talk about because first and foremost, when I think about um, tokenism, but I'll give an example around um, karanga. So being asked to do, um, to do karanga, um, even if I'm feeling uncomfortable about it, I used to say yes all the time. Um, and the reason why I think subconsciously that I'd always say yes is because I know in myself and that I want to ensure that tikanga is being upheld. Um, that's mm. first and foremost because, and that's the reason sometimes I say yes, even though I'm feeling a little uncomfortable about it, because I want to see that um, tikanga is being upheld. And a kōrero that myself and um, a good friend of mine, Hakopa, had um, around this specific um, kaupapa of tikanga is that tikanga should never be the role of an individual. Tikanga is a collective responsibility. Um, so when I'm talking about um, when I'm talking about, oh man, I feel the weight um, of my culture on my shoulders. If I don't do this karanga, māwai ke kawe i ngā tikanga. Um, I just want to say to anybody out there who's, who, who has felt that, um, it is not your responsibility to, to hold the weight of your mm -hmm. culture at tikanga. We're seeing tikanga be adaptable now. So be, um, be that, be adaptable. You know, I think um, an example of adaptability mm. with karanga is whakato. So we have pōhiri um, and then we have whakato. So there are opportunities and um, ways in which we can be adaptable around tikanga. So yeah, I think that's something that those of us who have been that token person has felt um, quite significantly is that, oh man, shit, I want tikanga to be upheld. So I'll do this even though I'm feeling uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, like I said, I've, I've um, recognized it now and now I'm able to um, safely um, first and foremost protect myself and say look you know what no I'm not I'm feeling comfortable to do that um, and it's something little like translating um, which comes off like legalities around the te reo te reo Māori um, and the te tauraferi and, and government and, and then just other things or a kui or auntie uncle seeing this and seeing Oh, he could translated that, and you know, straight away it's going to come back to me. So it's just those kind of things, you know. That you know, you don't want that. You don't want that responsibility mm -hmm. on you. So first and foremost, I think um, when called upon to be that token person, you know, um, first of all, if, if you if you recognise to tokenism, don't necessarily assume that the person who or co papa that's asking of you knows that they're wanting you to be the token token person because obviously they're seeing. Um, a taonga within you, um, so so acknowledge that, um, and then keep yourself um, safe. Like I said, you can say no; you don't have to say yes um, all the time. And if you're not feeling comfortable to say to say no, find somebody that you trust. Um, whether, for example, if it's in mahi, your manager or a tuakana or somebody at mahi. Um, if you're at a at a pakeha hui, oh frick, I think just say no um, straight away. But um, but you know there are there are people that you can get to say no on your behalf if you're not feeling um comfortable or safe enough to do so. And this is not only in contexts um of Te Ao Māori. I've seen it um being at conferences, being at like I said um before Pakeha Hui, which well I suppose it's a conference um where you're not the token Māori but you're the token brown person, which is you know that's an even bigger demographic. Te Ao Māori is you know the token indigenous person, the token wahine or woman um, is a big one, and, and token rangatai. So I think um, yeah, to being the token Māori for me personally is the hardest one to say no to, just because of that tikanga aspect. Mm -hmm. And then the other ones, I'm kind of just like, meh. For maybe because I'm lazy. No, I don't. Oh, and yes. so um, might have been a column. I can't even remember who wrote it. All I remember is this one section, and it was only recent, maybe in the last fortnight, where I was reading how 
organizations plan our pōhiri into their function or into their day or into their conference before actually talking to the Māori who will do that pōhiri. And so they just assume that Māori are waiting, ready, at the jump of a hat to come and perform their pōhiri that they want for their thing. Um, and it was a really good, it was a really good kōrero, but I can't remember where it was or who read it. Um, but it just got me thinking about that, how sometimes it is just assumed that we are all sitting around waiting to be asked to do oh, our... it's style <laughs> of oh, Māori. <laughs> <laughs> and um, like, yeah, you just pointed out a really um, good thing actually is that um, being token doesn't necessarily look um, individual it can be called upon um, in the masses you know um, maybe to take this um, this um, korero to brownify or to maldify um, the kaupapa you know they're going to call mm. a welcome a pōhiri uh, which is yeah like when, when you mentioned pōhiri like I see pōhiri happening at event centres and everything um you know and e harau te tangata you know tohunga ki ngā tikanga te wai anō ki au nei um ko tā te pōhiri ka taki nā ki te maroa um so pōhiri for me isn't necessarily something that should happen in your building at mahi or your event centre you call it whakato because that's Pretty much um, what it is. What it is. I'm just going to shut up now before I get my hands <laughs> up. Um, now we like but, strong opinions on Nuki. Go for <laughs> them. But um, yeah, so like, um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, like I was saying, um, being token doesn't necessarily look um, individual. It looks like being the token iwi or the token country, mm. or the token indigenous culture, you know, like mm. Um, I'm just going to put the pātai out to those that are watching. Don't just watch us from your box at home. It's a little bit, you know. Engage in the corridor. Got any pātai? Ask us your pātai. Um, we're probably going to sign off really soon. So if you do have any burning questions for Moirangi, uh, whether it be about boy <laughs> or te reo Māori or rangatahi maumoko or kina, <laughs> You might want to ask you where all the best kana spots are. Uh, <laughs> but if you have any part time, now's your time. Um, I just remembered one more resource for Maramataka, which is the spin-off Atia. Um, I am not a anything Maramataka. I only know what I know, but I uh, had written an article a few years ago about the basics of what Maramataka is, and then the beautiful Eila Hoeta has been sharing monthly Maramataka corridor on the spin-off. Um, her Maramataka is aligned with the Manuko Harbour and Tamaki Makoto, um, but she does talk about uh, for that for the particular month that we're in, planting days, wānanga days, um, the tohu o te rangi, tohu o te whenua, tohu o te moana And so it's another resource if people are interested um, I literally am going to ask one last time If anybody has any pāpai Where do you see yourself in five years? Who was that? I just want to see if it's my, one of my blinger friends Kyla oh. <laughs> It's one of my best friends <laughs> <laughs> Where do I, do you go first? Oh, that wasn't for me? <laughs> Hold on five years. <laughs> you go first, because then otherwise, you know, I might steal your answer or whatever. That <laughs> um, where do I see myself in five years? It's like a real simple question, but like not. Um, for me anyways. Um, How old are you now, Moirangi? I'm 23. Oh, yeah, you're very young. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, to answer this part, I, I don't necessarily see myself in a place, um, like I don't see myself in Wellington, I don't see myself in a role. Um, I just want, I want to answer this question um, in terms of, yeah, mokuake. So, hei te rima tau e heke mai ana, um, e manako nui ana wau, um, e hari koa ana wau, ha, kai te kōrero Māori tonu, um, Pa ora rawa a uh, tōku marae, uh, me te pai pai o tōku marae, uh, a taua wā, um, a ki te apea ko te oranga tonutanga o, o tōku kura kainga, uh, e mana ko nui ana 
uh, ko tutuki e wau uh, i wetehi whainga. Um, yeah, so I didn't want to answer that question in a, in a necessarily a space, a place, or a role. Um, but hopefully um, where I see myself um, is five, in five years as somebody that's still speaking Māori um, and continuously fighting for te reo Māori. Um, I want to see the pai pai um, on my marae um, in a safe um, in safe hands and in a safe mm-hmm. place. Um, I want to see our kura, my kura, kaupapa back home, kawakawa mai tapiti, thriving. Um, and I want to see myself um, still having or bettering uh, my relationship with, with whenua. So that's, yeah, I know it's not, it's a very unorthodox answer to, to that question. You know, I don't see myself prime minister or anything. But yeah, Māori tonu e um, Aotearoa. Um, I don't think that part I was for me, but if I just be nice and answer it anyway. I, in five years' time, I'll be fluent in te reo Māori. That's where I see myself. There you go. That's my answer. Um, Moirangi, I saw you on the front line on the whenua at Ihumātau day after day and night. How did you see it through your eyes? That's a part I from Julia. How did I see it through my eyes? No. Um, I, ooh, how did I see it through my eyes? Sorry, it's like a little bit emotional <laughs> because, you know, you would know, no te whenua, no koutou te mana whenua. I saw it as a beautiful um, awakening and I, I want to take this, um, I know this is supposed to be my answer, um, but just the whakaako that I've heard um, from Te Koro, who's somebody who wants to make, well not wants to make, who does make um, te reo Māori cool, you know, making te reo Māori relevant again. Anyway, I'm going off topic here. And one thing that he um, says is that when he saw um, the Rugby League World Cup happening, um, you know, mate ma'atonga, you think of mate ma'atonga, them waving around their flags, and they're so proud to be Tongan, you know, you, you very rarely, um, and I don't want to speak for the Tongan culture, but they speak their language like nothing, you know. They've got, they speak all their swear words and everything um, like that. So they speak their language and they're really proud to be Tongan. Mm-hmm. Um, and same as Te Koro, it wasn't until, um, you know, for, like, if, and if you think of our own league team, the Warriors, go the Warriors. <laughs> um, you think of our league team, I don't go to no league game seeing everybody mana māori up as I do a mate ma'a Tonga game. You know that Tonga's in town and they're not even at the fields. You can hear them two blinking blocks away, um, you know. So, um, and the same as an all-black game, you don't go to an all-black game and you automatically think, yeah, mana māori. But what you did see at Ihu Mātau was, wow, mana māori. Um, whether that looked like you know, for, for every, in terms of everybody else, if that's what it looked like for them. But that's what I felt. I was like, yes, finally. Not finally, because I think people are proud to be Māori, but collectively I saw people proud to be Māori. I saw people proud to protect whenua that wasn't even their own, you know, haranoku te whenua, but I was proud to be there. I was proud to be Māori. I was proud to be singing waiata Māori in protection, um, of the whenua. So for me, it was an awakening um, of Tiwi Māori to be, to be proud to be Māori, you know. Coming back to that whole tokenistic thing, you know, tokenism doesn't just look like Pākehā asking us to be Māori or Kaupapa asking us to be Māori when they call upon it. Um, some, oh, okay, I don't want to call people out, but, you know, tokenism also looks like us being that token well, you know, being Māori when we want to be Māori. But what I saw at Ihu Mato was everybody wanted to be Māori. And the majority of people that I spent most of my time there um, with took a lot of inspiration from Ihu Mato, Ana ka whanake, tonu tō rato, um, Māori tanga. So, yeah, I saw proud to be Māori. Aside from all the politics and everything that happened around it, I saw the iwi Māori being proud to be Māori. Mm. Oh. <laughs> I just listen to that and I just think about, and I know this isn't about Ihumato, so I don't want to overtake the conversation because I'm sure one day 
One of my nuku korero will be about all the everything so the Um but to hear you say that and to think back, I don't know if you can see. See that kitchen table there? <laughs> it's where the kaupapa of the whenua started. And to just hear you share your experience in the way that you just did. Um, I know that five years ago when we sat at that table, we never thought that we would get to a point where we would hear people saying that. So anyway, move on. Uh, <laughs> move on to the next part. We both cry. <laughs> <laughs> I've, had too much, I've had too much cider tonight to carry on the recording. <laughs> um, I don't want to fuck this one up. I'm going to try and I'm pretty sure I can say this part. I sorry, Brad, if I get this wrong. Um, kia pehia te rua ka noho a Jacinda hei perimia mo 20 years. Okay. Was that the question? That's the question. And then it was an LOL. Long. Oh, I don't, I don't know if that's a. Oh, is he asking? Maybe he's asking, what do we think about Jacinda being the Prime Minister for the next 20 years? Maybe. Ja, pehia te roa kanoho a Jacinda hei perimia. Um, I don't know. Vote, everybody. Jokes. <laughs> um, no, kare o te mohio, sorry. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> what do you reckon? <laughs> um, I think Auntie, the, Auntie Jay's a bit of a touchy topic, but you yeah, know, she, she's yeah. doing. Just hear the kōrero about him. <laughs> you know what? I will. I will give her credit. She has done a good job around COVID nineteen, given the circumstances happening around the world. And I think we would be totally fucked if Simon Bridges was our prime minister right now. So that's all I'll say on, on that one. Um, from Emalani Case. Moirangi, your support for us on Mauna Kea has been so inspiring. What does Indigenous solidarity in our Pacific mean to you? Oh, aloha kumu. Um, indigenous, indigenous solidarity look like for me? Um, oh, to be honest, um, I... I don't know, um, but if I can talk to the example of Monakia, of Ihu Mato, um, and the ways in which those two kopapa kind of wove in and out of each other, um, that could be, um, that's maybe one way in terms of what it looks like. Um, and just to give an example to those of you who, who weren't necessarily at Ihu Mato um, or on Monakia, um, there was constant correspondence between um, us at Ihu Mato, um to our ohana on Mauna Kea, um, and it was just one of the be most beautiful things um, when I when I think about um, like this this fakaro is fakaro is the thought. Um, you know, you could talk to someone and be like, "Hey, I'm I'm thinking of you," and you know, like that's a really beautiful thing to be thinking of someone. You know, that person's on your heart, on your mind. Um, so when when that looks um indigenous wide, um, just having karakia for Mona Kia, for Mona Kia having karakia um for Ihu Mato to hold that space and just have the kopapa that person um the movement on your mind, um, in your kupu, in your pūre, in your karakia, um, in your aroha, I think um, that was a really beautiful thing um, to witness and be a part of. Um, so, yeah, just like simply is having having solidarity um, for kaupapa, indigenous kaupapa um, in your mind, you know. Um, I'm not, like, Mauna is not over, ihu mātou, you know, it's not over. Um, <laughs> but having, just having that really, it's really simple for me, is just having it um, on your mind, st speaking to people about it, um, learning te reo Māori. Nah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just really simply, I think for me, it looks like just learning about it, understanding it um, on a real um, kind of heart-to-heart -heart, um, note. Because I think the thing for me, um, when you know that um, somebody's kind of got your back, um, and that's what solidarity is, eh? Solid having backs, 
It's like, yeah, I got your back. I'm thinking about you. How can I help you? Mm. And you yeah. keep each other's, um, you help each other keep the faith in the whawhai. Yeah. I, um, I know this part I wasn't to me, but when I think about what Indigenous solidarity is in, in our Pacific or in Te Mwananui Akiwa, and I look at not just Polynesia, but Melanesia, Micronesia, um, and then, of course, across the Ao, um, you know, I, f- I f- am really proud when Indigenous peoples amplify the take of other Indigenous peoples in their own countries and um, the corridor elevating the corridor um, politically in the community. And so I think about things like West Papua and I think about um, the, we had a rupu come over from uh, Te Whenua Moe Moia who were um, protecting their birthing trees there um, and, and just sharing that corridor when we think about even Standing Rock um, and what continues to happen on Turtle Island. Um, and then, of course, we think about Mauna Kea, which is still ongoing. Auntie Pua was supposed to uh, come to Aotearoa uh, the week that we went into lockdown, or like the week-ish, the week before. Um, and again, that was about connecting Mauna Kea to Aotearoa, sharing those stories, um, learning from each other, amplifying each other's messages. And um, it's really... I think the the way that we're able to connect internationally through the technology we currently have is really amazing, but we need to ensure that um, if we're in a country where things are going fairly well for us, we need to be giving voice to our brothers and sisters around the world where things are not going so well for them. I don't have to cut you off, but um, I think when we do so, when we connect, um, like mm. you said, um, we allow and give others um, with without not necessarily without a voice but for example like West Papua we give others um, the voice that they need and we allow them um, to do the same to have a voice so when we speak up when we say I've got your back Mm -hmm. um, it means so much more than than what you think like hey just I I think I can speak on this Um, every share every comment every thinking of you um, when we were on the whenua um, at Ihumato and I think for those of you who have fought the long fight for the past five years and still to this day, every single like, comment, share, call matters, you know? That whole I got your back thing, we're allowing others to have a voice. Mm. Well, we could carry on for ages, but um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that's probably a nice place to leave it for tonight. Uh, I really want to thank you for coming to Korero with us on Nuku Atu, um, which is our Rahui alternative to the Nuku 100, um, which I'm really enjoying. I might keep it once we come out of Rahui. Um, if those of you who are watching are not familiar with Nuku, like this Facebook page, um, jump on Instagram at Nuku Woman. We have 30 podcasts so far. The aim is to interview 100 Kakas Indigenous Wahine doing things differently. The first 30 are on our website, nukuwoman.co.nz. It's also on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and like nine other podcast channels that I can never remember their names. Um, it's a passion, Kaupapa. We don't make money off it. We do it for aroha. We think it's just a really choice, kaupapa. Um, and so those of us that put it together, um, which is myself um, and some really cool wahine that have not given up on me yet, um, <laughs> who helped put it together, please do go and check it out. Please listen to um, the stories of the wahine. Um, and... Just thank you, Moirangi. Your corridor tonight has been really awesome. I've really enjoyed it. And I look forward to the day that you can go back to the moana and go diving for your kina. Kia ora. Kia ora e hoa. O tira um, koutou i hono mai uh, i te pōnei. Wai maria au au. Uh, te noho uh, hei manuhiri ki tēnei kaupapa au. Uh, o tira hei hoa uh, ki a koe me o te mi kaupapa. 
a i tēnei wā e mana kono yana e noho pai ana a koe me tō whānau. Um, yeah, just wanna mihi to you. Thank you um, for having me. Um, to those of you who are listening, probably the majority are our friends, which is really, really cool. It's the whole I got your back thing again. Um, <laughs> but either, yeah, e mihi ana, e mihi nui ana. Uh, kia koutou, hope you're all safe. Um, hope you're all warm and safe. Kapai. Um, we open with the karakia, so I'll close us with the karakia just to make sure that we close that realm. Um, and I learned this karakia again because I'm learning te reo Māori anō. Um, <laughs> learned this karakia from Scotty Morrison. Um, tu tawa mai runga, tu tawa mai raro, tu tawa mai roto, tu tawa mai waho. Kia tau te Māori tu, te Māori ora, ki te katoa, hau mie, huie. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Pomarie. 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 Pomarie.